Hello everybody, my name is uh, Itai and I would like to tell you um, about my paper, tight uh, time-space lower bounds for finding multiple collision pairs and their applications. So I'll start by considering a very basic birthday problem. So assume we are given Oracle access to a random function uh, with a domain and range uh, of size n. And the goal is to output some uh, colliding pair, meaning x and y, that are different, such that f of x equals f of y. So this can be done using uh, t um, queries to the function, or time complexity t, such that t squared uh, equals n. And this is uh, known to be tight, uh, and it is basically uh, the birthday bound. So now let, let's consider a ger generalized uh, variant of this problem. So the problem, the setting is essentially the same, but now we're given also this parameter C. And the goal is to output the C uh, distinct colliding pairs, X1, Y1, Xc, Yc, and this function f, meaning that uh, each pair, uh, uh, for each pair Xi uh, is different than Yi, but they have the same image uh, under f. And I also consider a variant of this problem, where here we are actually given two uh, access to two random functions, and again a parameter c, and now the goal is to output uh, the colliding pairs, the colliding pairs between these two functions, meaning that for every i, f1 of xi equals f2 of xi. And these variants are essentially equivalent, and I'm not going to really distinguish uh, between them um, throughout the rest of this talk. Okay, so what uh, do we know about this, variant, about this problem? Basically, it can be solved in time t, such that t squared uh, is, uh, um, about c times n. So notice that if you plug in uh, one for the c here, then you get uh, back the birthday, um, the birthday complexity. And uh, this, uh, um, this, uh, these parameters are actually known to be tight. And this is a variant or general generalization of the birthday bound. So up to now, it was not very interesting. Uh, so let's make it a bit more interesting by uh, um, adding some restriction. So let's assume that the algorithm, uh, the space of the algorithm is restricted by S bits. So now it's no longer trivial, trivial because it seems like the, in order to find these uh, C distinct uh, colliding pairs, you kind of have to uh, maybe store the outputs of F, right? Uh, and um, if your space is restricted, it's not clear how to do this. So what's uh, the best known algorithm for this problem? Uh, so it's called parallel collision search or PCS and it's a classical cryptanalytic algorithm published by uh, Van Orschet and Weiner in 96. And uh, it basically gives you uh, the optimal trade-off assuming S equals C. Okay, so if uh, your amount of space is equal roughly to the number of collisions that you want to find, then you can get this optimal trade. However, the question is what happens when uh, you have less memory density? Well, in this case, you can uh, generalize the PCS algorithm and it gives you this, this trade-off T squared S times S equals C squared time, times N. And um, you can see that if you plug in S uh, equals C here, you get back the this trade-off, which is known to be optimal. Okay, however, when S is smaller than C, it's, not, it's no, no longer clear that this is actually optimal. So I want to give you a sense of how this parallel collision search uh, algorithm works, uh, and I'll consider a very degenerate set of parameters. So let's assume that your space is uh, very small, say one or log n bits, uh, something like that, and you want to output n collisions. Well, what, you, what can you do in this case? Well, what you can do is uh, basically uh, run some memoryless uh, cycle collision finding algorithm, such as a classical Floyd's algorithm, and it's going to find you one collision in about the uh, square root of n time. So if you uh, repeat this uh, about n times, then you would get uh, 
roughly the n collisions uh, that you want, you would be able to output them, and the time complexity will be about n to the uh, 1.5. And the generalized, uh, sorry, the parallel collision search algorithm is basically a generalization of uh, this uh, algorithm for a larger amount of memory. Okay, so the trade-off that you get basically is this by PCS. And the question is whether it is optimal. So before uh, diving into this question, I want to motivate it. So why is this even interesting? So notice that when uh, S is smaller than C, which is the parameter range we're considering, then you can actually, you, you're, you, you cannot store the output uh, uh, because uh, you don't have enough space. Uh, so is this interesting in terms of applications? And it turns out that it is. So uh, I'll uh, give you an example, which is actually quite important. Uh, uh, so the application will be breaking double encryption. Okay, so assume we are given a, a block cipher double encryption. So in order to encrypt P, you encrypt it under uh, K1, and then the result to encrypt under K2, and the ciphertext uh, is denoted by, uh, uh, by C. So let's assume for simplicity that all parameters are taken for, uh, from uh, the same range, uh, so from the same uh, set of uh, size N. And the setting is uh, that you're given uh, several plain text ciphertext pairs encrypted under uh, the same key, and the goal is to recover the key. And the best attack uh, on double encryption is the meet in the middle attack. And it uh, gives you essentially optimal time complexity of n, however, it requires a large amount of space. Basically, what you do as, uh, as you encrypt P1 under all possible values of K1 and store these results in the middle, and then you, uh, th then you uh, kind of uh, try to match from the decryption set. Okay, well, however, this requires uh, a large amount of space. And what happens what, when your space is limited? Let's say one or log n bits and so forth. So what you can do in this case is you uh, define two functions. So the function F1, uh, is defined as far as it's going to take uh, uh, as, in, as input the key k1 and it's going to be defined um, um, by encrypting uh, the fixed uh, plain text p1 under k1 that's the uh, that's f1 and it corresponds to this uh, downwards arrow here and the function f2 is going to take uh, as input uh, k2 um, and it's uh, going to um, return the decryption of this fixed C1 under K2. So it basically corresponds to this arrow here. Okay, so now uh, uh, basically the problem reduces to a collision fighting between F1 and F2, because each such collision uh, gives you a key candidate uh, that encrypts uh, P1 to C1. However, you're not sure that, uh, what you, that th this can candidate is correct because uh, you, you have to uh, test it under the remaining keys. Uh, sorry, under the remaining plain text ciphertext pairs. And in order to analyze this, you have to uh, um, estimate how many collisions you have to find between these two functions until you uh, find this uh, right key. So essentially, um, it turns out that you have to find almost n collisions between these two functions. And the reason is that uh, you cannot uh, kind of tell the keys apart just by looking at P1 and C1. Okay, you have to uh, uh, test each one of them uh, on the remaining plain, plain text ciphertext pairs. So you have to find uh, basically n collisions. So we reduce the problem to a problem of a collision finding where the C equals N. Okay, and we call that S is small. It's like, uh, I don't know, one or log N bits. And now if you plug in these parameters into the time space trade-off of uh, parallel collision search, we get this formula. So T uh, is roughly N to the 1.5, and this is the best known attack with the, these uh, parameters uh, on double encryption. And what's important here is that the, the space is much uh, smaller than the number of collisions we want to find. 
So this demonstrates that this is actually an interesting range of parameters. So going back to the question, is this trade of optimal? Um, um, so this question has uh, several applications. So if this trade-off is not optimal, then uh, what you can do is you can improve the best known time space trade-off for breaking double encryption, as I've just shown you. And actually there are additional applications to this. If this trade-off is, op is not optimal, you can actually improve uh, the trade-offs for various meet in the middle type of attacks at least in some range of parameters, like break and triple or multiple encryption, some uh, dedicated meet in the middle attacks on specific crypto systems and uh, an application of solving a generalized birthday problem, solving subset uh, sum problem and uh, additional applications. So if this trade-off is not optimal, uh, this would have kind of far reaching consequences. Okay, you can uh, uh, improve uh, many time space uh, algorithms um, for well known problems. So, summarizing our results, the first result, our first result is that we prove that this time space trade off or collision search uh, is actually optimal. Okay, and this is. Uh, this is true for all parameters, including uh, values of S, which are smaller than C. And the conclusion of this is that the trade-off algorithms for all the applications that I discussed cannot be improved uh, by a more efficient collision search algorithm because it does not exist. However, it does not mean that you cannot improve these, uh, the trade-offs for these applications by some other algorithm. So it would be, of course, very interesting to, to see if we can improve, for example, the time-space trade-off of uh, double encryption, or rather uh, prove that uh, we cannot improve it, uh, that it is optimal. Unfortunately, um, if we manage to, improve, uh, to prove that uh, the time-space trade-off of uh, uh, breaking double encryption and the additional applications is optimal, then it would uh, overcome some long-standing barrier in uh, complexity theory. Basically, it means that it is, uh, you expect this to be very hard to prove the optimality of the, this trade-off. So um, at this stage, it should not be very clear why uh, we can prove the optimality of the time-space trade-off for collision search uh, uh, but not for these applications. Okay, so I'll get to, to this uh, at a later stage. However, I should mention that the, this uh, barrier only applies in uh, unrestricted uh, computational models. However, if you restrict the algorithm in, in some ways, then sometimes you can prove time space lower bounds. And this actually brings me to the second result. So we focus on the application of breaking double encryption and show that under some uh, restriction, the best uh, known time space uh, trade-off is actually optimal. And this is the second result. So in the re remainder of the talk, I'll focus on these two results and I'll start with the, start with the first one. Okay, so um, we want to prove the, this, uh, that this trade-off is optimal for uh, the collision search problem. And in order to do so, what we do is to adapt the framework of Borodin and Cook, which, is, uh, was, was, which was published already in 1982. And it was used in the several, to derive several time space lower bounds for interesting applications, such as sorting, uh, matrix multipl multiplication, et cetera. However, this seems to be the first time it is used in the domain of cryptography, which is uh, kind of interesting. So I'm going to give you a very high level intuition of uh, how the proof uh, works. So let's uh, assume that uh, we, have a, we have an algorithm that outputs collisions and it runs in time t. And we're going to divide this, uh, this uh, interval, long interval of t into L short time intervals, each one of length t prime, which is t divided by L. And we say that the algorithm makes progress in an interval if it outputs uh, C prime, which is C divided by L collisions in an interval. Okay, so now let's focus on an interval and consider a mini problem of outputting C prime collisions in time T prime. 
And the first stage of the proof would be to prove that any such many algorithm succeeds with a very small probability, uh, which is bounded by some small epsilon. And the probability here will be over the choice of the random function f. Notice that uh, up to this point, actually this, uh, this proof is uh, completely independent of the memory of the algorithm, which will come into play in the second part. Okay, so in the second part, um, I noticed that in order to output uh, C collisions, uh, overall the algorithm must output C prime collisions in some interval. Meaning that some mini algorithm must output C prime collisions. And notice that actually a mini algorithm in some interval is uh, defined from some initial memory state of the algorithm, right? From some, in it, from some memory state. Well, how many uh, memory states can there be? The algorithm only has S uh, bits of memory, so there can be at most two to the S such states. And so, so there can be at most two to the S kind of mini algorithms defined by this uh, big algorithm. And so if you take a union bound over all these mini algorithms, we know that each one can succeed with probability at most epsilon. We have at most two to the S such uh, algorithms. And then uh, you can bound the total uh, success probability of the algorithm by this, uh, uh, by this, uh, a formula two to the s times epsilon. And so if you prove that epsilon is much smaller than two to the minus s, basically you're done. Okay, you bounded the uh, success probability of the, of the, of the algorithm. And um, this is actually possible. This is what, uh, what I do in the paper. And uh, there are a few complications which uh, I don't have time to discuss. Uh, obviously we'll have to, uh, Take a look at, uh, in the paper to see how exactly this is done. This was just uh, intuition. This is not formal in any way. Okay, so let's move to the second part. So now let's consider the applications. So why cannot uh, we cannot use this framework to prove uh, optimality, for example, of uh, double encryption, of the attack on double encryption and so forth? So notice that we, uh, uh, in the proof, we kind of relied in a very strong way on the fact that the output of the algorithm is long, like the number C of the co collisions uh, should be large because we divided the, out the, like the algorithm into intervals and we said that the algorithm has a small chance of outputting a uh, kind of a fraction or chunk, a uh, small chunk of the output in an interval. However, if the output is short, then you can no longer do this. So it's not clear how to measure the progress of the algorithm with the short output towards sol solving uh, uh, the, the problem. And then more generally, there is a long-standing barrier in complexity theory which uh, states as it's basically very hard uh, to prove some meaningful by some definition of meaningful uh, time space uh, trade of lower bound for short output problems in uh, general computational models. However, if you uh, restrict the algorithm in some way, then there is some chance, and this is what actually what we do in the second uh, uh, result. So in the second, uh, towards the second result, uh, focus on, uh, on breaking double encryption. So the best known uh, algorithm for, uh, for this problem is based on parallel collision search. Okay, and actually I'll uh, kind of show you how, how, it, how the reduction works. And uh, this is uh, the time space uh, trade-off that you get. And what we're interested in, of course, is showing uh, that this is optimal. Okay, so is this uh, optimal? And uh, by what I've just said, um, we cannot really hope to, uh, to prove this unconditionally, so we have to make some restriction. And the restriction that we make is, uh, is defined, uh, we're, we're going to define new computational model and we're going to call it the post-filtering model. And let's see in the second part. So in general, the post, in the post-filtering model, our algorithm is going to get full access uh, only to a part of the input. 
uh, while the access kind of to the remaining part is going to be restricted by some post filtering oracle. Basically, for this to be meaningful, given the first part of the input, there should exist uh, many equally likely potential solutions that the algorithm cannot tell apart just by looking at the first part of the input. And the algorithm kind of has to feed the, these potential solutions to the post filtering oracle, which um, gets as an input a potential solution and uh, outputs uh, true, let's say, if this is a right solution for the entire problem. So this is the post filtering oracle. And if there are many equally likely solutions, then the algorithm has to produce kind of many, all of these solutions to the post filtering oracle. So note that the model forces a reduction from a short output problem to a related long output problem. And for these long output problems, we already know how to prove time and space, lower bounds, as I have shown. So let's be more specific and focus on the problem of breaking double encryption. So recall that the best known uh, uh, attack for this uh, concentrates on uh, P1 and C1 and analyzes uh, this, uh, this pair, but uses the remaining plain text ciphertext pairs only for post filtering uh, purposes, okay, to post filter key suggestions. So what uh, uh, is going, so how is the post filtering uh, model going to be defined for this specific problem? Well, the algorithm is going to get access to the block cipher, of course, uh, the plain text, the first plain text cipher text pair. And in addition, it's going to get an access to a post filter oracle, which gets as an input a key and it returns one only on the correct key. Okay, so notice that this uh, captures the parallel collision search based attack, but also various uh, generalizations of this, which we maybe haven't thought of. And uh, we prove that the best known time space uh, trade off attack for double encryption, the PCS based one, is optimal for any post filtering attack uh, on double encryption. And this is, um, this is kind of nice because the model is clean. It uh, abstracts away the, the lower level collision search problem. So there are no collisions uh, defined in this model. A kind of a kind of clean model, and the conclusion from this uh, from this result is that in order to improve this trade-off, if you want to improve it, you must somehow combine information from multiple plain text ciphertext pairs in a non-trivial way in the analysis. So, so this kind of gives you a hint on what you have to do if you want to improve this algorithm. So let me uh, conclude the talk. So. I've uh, um, shown you that uh, the best known time space trade off uh, for the collision search problem, uh, best known time space trade off for the collision uh, uh, search problem is optimal. And I presented the post filtering model, which is a restricted model of computation, and showed that under this model, uh, the best known time space uh, trade off uh, algorithm. Uh, for breaking double encryption is optimal. You cannot do better under this uh, model. So in the future, it would be interesting to extend this post filtering model and prove time space lower bounds for additional problems. And of course, it would be interesting to try to bypass this model as I um, told you uh, maybe a minute ago and uh, try to uh, improve algorithms. For example, to improve the best known algorithm for double encryption which would be, of course, a very, uh, very nice result. Uh, and uh, currently, we don't know how to rule this possibility out with the current techniques. And so I hope you've uh, enjoyed this, uh, uh, this talk. And I encourage you uh, to take a look at the paper. Uh, and I thank you very much for your attention.